Today we're sitting down with Dustin Reekman, partner at Fire Creek Snacks and also the owner of Simple Success Coaching. Dustin first started off in the engineering industry where he left corporate America to become an entrepreneur and decided to go to school and really study digital marketing and online e-commerce businesses. And today helps businesses walk through how to create partnership marketing relationships, how to lead with a win, and get clarity in your business with very simple 90-day strategic marketing plans. Now, you can learn a lot today. We even dive into some relationship and marriage counseling as Dustin previously was a co-founder of a business called engagedmarriage.com, which still exists today as a business. And we go through the four pillars of a successful marriage. We think you're really gonna enjoy this conversation today with Dustin Reekman. Dustin, welcome to the Entrepreneurs United podcast. Excited to speak with you today. Yeah, same, very excited. Awesome. Can you tell our audience a little bit about you, yourself, and where you're from and what you're doing? Absolutely. Yeah, my name is Dustin Reekman. I'm from Illinois. I live just outside of St. Louis, Missouri. And I have, uh, as many of your guests, I have a very varied entrepreneurial journey. But at the core of it started actually with an engineering career. So I was an engineering consultant for 18 years and had probably a dozen side hustles through the years while I was doing that and scratching my entrepreneurial itch. And I eventually left in the end of 2017 from, from that career and have been self-employed ever since and have a couple of different uh, ventures going right now that keep me busy. Awesome. Awesome. So you went to school formally for engineering and then basically went full boat into the entrepreneurial landscape, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, over many years. But yes, I have a, have a master's degree. It was a very specialized uh, degree in traffic engineering. Okay. So that was a, it was a very tight niche, uh, but... Through that experience, you know, I, I grew and managed teams, did a lot of sales, did a lot of sales presentations. So it was engineering, but, you know, as I advanced, it became much more um, entrepreneurial, you know, I guess in, in a sense, but still always had this craving, this desire to leave that world and do my own thing completely. And, you know, I had a wife that stayed home and three children, so it wasn't an easy jump, but it did eventually no. make that leap, like I said, at the end of 2017. Okay. Awesome. So, so talk to me about that jump because certainly that was pre COVID pandemic. I yeah. think the COVID pandemic forced a lot of people to make a jump similar to the one that you made. What exactly kind of motivated you to say, you know what, I'm going to go for it uh, and take this leap of faith in this entrepreneurial landscape. Like, did you have an idea? Was it a product or a service or was it an opportunity? What, what kind of, you know, made that, made that possible? Yeah. So kind of, it actually goes back to all the way back to 2009. So I had a, for anyone who's seen the video, you can see behind me, uh, my first business online was called Engaged Marriage. Uh, it still exists. It's a, it was basically a passion project of my wife and I. And so it grew out of ministry, but it eventually became a business. And we wrote a book and did speaking and we have courses and a membership site. So all that was going on during my engineering career. So I had had a taste and I knew that we could, we had had some success you know, the income wasn't there to replace what I was doing in my nine to five. Sure. However, as, as that took off, I started basically being more passionate about digital marketing. And I did a lot of training on that and kind of took vacation from work to go to digital mar marketing conferences as much as my wife uh, didn't enjoy that. Um, but I fell, I fell in love with that part of online business in particular. And as I became vocal about that and became, I guess, confident in my abilities, I started picking up a lot of clients all inbound, all referral. And in fact, a lot of them were like literally my dentist became a client. Uh, a real, my real estate broker became a client. Uh, a restaurant uh, for my sister-in-law became a client. And so I was doing, again, all that started about 2016, 2017. So I had a lot going on. I knew that I had the chops, you know, to do this work as a consultant in the, in the marketing world. Um, and it was, and so mid-2017 is when I had a deep discussion with my wife and said, you know what, I've been kind of putting this off for years. I really want to try it. And there, there really was a light bulb moment, the proverbial moment where in a conversation with my wife, it just kind of hit me that, you know, this is not a permanent decision. You know, I had put so much pressure on it. It was so much my ident identity. Yeah. There's like this feeling that once I jump off the engineering boat, there's no climbing back on, which was not true at all. Right. As, as I thought about it, I'm like, I'm not leaving because I'm terrible at my work. I'm leaving because I want to. And I could probably go right back to the same firm and or another firm, right? And, and do the same work. So that gave me the comfort to kind of finally make the decision. And then I had that six months. I said, you know what, let's, I basically worked two full-time jobs plus, you know, doing all the consulting, engaged marriage while doing my day job for that last six months of 2017. 
And I said, let's just try it, you know, bear with me. Uh, and I had a good conversation with my wife and my kids, you know, I'm gonna be working a lot <laughs> over the next six months, more than even more than usual, but we're going to see where this leads us. And so by the end of that year, I kind of developed a stockpile of, of cash, you know, because I was doing both things at once. And it gave me the confidence to then go in and, and make that decision, you know, with my boss at the time. And as it turned out, it became, it was a really smooth transition. They actually, you know, paid me pretty handsomely to stay on and basically find and train my replacement. So the transition was much easier than I thought it would be. Um, but that, that's really how it all came to be. That's, you know, we can get into any, any of the specifics on that um, or, of course, what, what I've been doing uh, since, since that time. Yeah, no, I love it. I'll tell you that, you know, a lot of people struggle making that shift, right? It's such a solid career. I'm in engineering. I'm pretty stable here. And I love what your, your mindset was, right? A was you had the motivation and, and obviously the partnership with your wife to start a business while you were still employed. It kind of gave you some confidence that, hey, like maybe there's something here. But then also you had that fallback, right? Which is, look, if I go try entrepreneurism and I do it for a year or two and it doesn't quite work, I can always go back and get you know, a job with XYZ company. Right. Uh, so, you know, you have that security to know that you're, you're strong enough in that industry to make that leap. So I love that. Just to, to recap, I, 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 I think there's at least three businesses that I know of. Yeah. <laughs> engaged marriage, uh, fire Creek snacks and engaged um, digital solutions are the ones that I see on the surface. Are there any other businesses? And then I'd like for me to go back and tell us a little bit. Like, I'm really curious on engaged marriage. I want to learn a little bit more about that and about all these little businesses here. I'd love to. There are three. The engaged digital solutions uh, is probably still like on LinkedIn. Um, but that was more, that was that marketing consulting work. You know, I basically mm -hmm. needed a name to put it under. Some people asked to pay me. It wasn't paying like engaged marriage. Sure. Um, so I made up engaged digital solutions to serve that purpose. I no longer really am active with that. So the third okay. business, the thing I'm actually that I split my time with right now is Fire Creek Snacks, as you mentioned, and I'll talk about how we got, got into that. Okay. And then actually simplesuccesscoaching.com. I've basically transitioned out of the, what I would call consulting for marketing, which is, you know, implementation, like running Facebook ads for a dentist, those sort of things that I, that I did for a while during my transition. And now I, I really focus on coaching and strategy, um, much, much less on implementation for clients. But yeah. So engage marriage uh, to go all the way back. Yeah. I've been doing side hustles, again, lots of kind of interesting side hustles during my engineering career, but engaged marriage was different in that we were doing marriage ministry probably for five years, you know, through our church, helping couples that were preparing for marriage, as well as hosting marriage retreats and things like that for, for married couples. And we really had a passion for it. And if you guys can think all the way back to 2008, 2009, that was kind of the heyday of blogging, right? That's when everyone was starting to blog and a lot of, a lot of online businesses that are popular today started around that time. And so I, I got that same itch and I said, you know what? I kind of want a creative outlet. I want to use the right side of my brain because I do engineering all day. And so I went and learned how to make a, a WordPress website and just started writing. So I just wrote like three days of three, three blog posts a week, started getting a lot of connections and reaching out to a lot of people in that niche and just, you know, developed a lot of collaborations and it really grew quickly from a traffic standpoint. So, but it, it remained basically a hobby. Then 2011, when we wrote the book, 15-Minute Marriage Makeover, it was kind okay. of a summation of what we had learned and what we had applied in our own relationship at that point. We had been married at 10 years at that point. So now we've been married uh, just over 20 as we sit here today. But uh, so we wrote the book and we got invited to speak as a result. And, and so it, it started to feel like a business. And it was at 2015. So again, this is another couple of years later, is when I really started to deep dive and study and get certifications and everything in digital marketing. So once I learned about sales funnels and how to really sell a membership and how to create digital courses and all those sort of things, that's when it became a real business. It's when it created you know, significant monthly income that really started to make me think I could probably leave engineering at some point. So that in engaged marriage since then, it still is there. We still have a very strong email list. We still are engaged with it, but we haven't really created new content or anything for several years. It's kind of a passive income for us, a passive business at this point. And we still do things through our church. So we still kind of have the ministry aspect, but engaged marriage itself um, is there and it serves people, but I don't spend more than probably an hour a week thinking about that business. Gotcha. So, so I understand, uh, sorry, in engaged marriage, I understand a uh, simple success coaching based on your description and Fire Creek Snacks, just a little bit on that before we yeah. go to Rich. Yeah. So Fire Creek Snacks grew out of that local consulting I started doing when I left engineering. So in 2018, it was only a few months after I left my engineering job. 
I was literally in my local butcher shop that had opened up with my wife on a Sunday afternoon, speaking to the guy behind the counter about steaks or something and um, realized that this business was much more than it looked like on the surface. This was his third location. He was about my age. And I was just really interested. And I mentioned to him, you know, I do some marketing consulting in the community. And so we had lunch and he shared that he needed help marketing his brick and mortar stores, which I did. So I ended up doing his email list, his Facebook ads, I built a website for him. And so we developed a relationship through that in 2018. Kind of at the tail end of that year, he was making a transition with a brand he had developed called Fire Creek. And it was basically, it was kind of stuck as a local brand. He was going from jerky, like whole muscle, you know, traditional jerky into snack sticks, which was kind of a big trend. And he wanted support in that. And he really wanted to start selling online. And I said, look, you know, his name's Ryan Hansen, and um, he's now my business partner, but to, to bury the lead. But at the time I said, look, one of my big things that, that, that I believe deeply in is leading with a win for others and trying to serve first. I really, I've, every, everything that's good in my life has come from taking that attitude. And so that's the approach I took with Ryan. I said, right, you know, going into 2019, I said, look, I've never done it, but I'll create a Shopify store. Um, you know, we've got your email list that we built from your local business here. We can start selling to those people and their friends and family, and we'll see where it takes us. And I said, do you have to pay me anything? You know, if it takes off, we can come up with like a rev share off the online sales or, you know, we'll see what makes sense. And so we did that. And uh, yeah, it took off pretty well. Uh, we we ended up going to a dozen trade shows together in 2019. So, I mean, we hit the road hard and got into a lot of brick and mortar stores. The online sales were doing pretty good. Um, and yeah, so as of today, we're 60, 40 partners in that business. Um, and it will hit seven figures this year in sales for in, in, the, in this calendar year. We've done way, way more than that over the past several years combined. But yeah, it's... Uh, so it's an e-commerce business. It, it's that's where I spend, you know, half my time is managing that, the sales and marketing aspect. Ryan is the product, you know, distribution, fulfillment side of the house. I really do the online marketing. Do a lot of um, what, I, what I call partnership marketing, which we'll talk about. I'm sure uh, that's kind of how I grew, grew Fire Creek in, in general, and I've grown Simple Success Coaching as well. But yeah, happy to answer any questions about Fire Creek. The basic product there is we sell craft meat sticks, right? Like better for you versions of what people might think of like a Slim Jim, but uh, clean, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, soy, MSG, uh, but it's really, really tasty. So I, I fell in love with the product first. I approached Ryan about it and said, are these yours too? Because they they had uh, the same hometown. He said, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd like to get these out bigger. He was just selling to some golf courses and selling in his own shops. And uh, that was the origin story of Fire Creek. Seven figures. Yeah, this year. That's uh, that's amazing. I'm assuming and I'll tell you why I'm assuming it, but I'm assuming on the 60 40 partnership, Ryan is the 60. Yep. Now, I'll tell you why I'm assuming, because if you were the 60, it would be called engaged sticks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it would be orange. Right? I guess it does have orange in it. So orange or green are like you, you can see all my businesses have one of those two colors, uh, including Fire Creek, although that predated me. But yeah, that's a that's a good assumption. So as the majority shareholder, you got outvoted and the word engaged is not part of it. Um <laughs> I'm curious uh, to dial back uh, just off your website on engaged marriage. It's a topic that we don't touch on enough, probably on our podcast. And what a great opportunity to get into a little bit of it with you. Yeah. On the importance of a happy, healthy marriage in the life of an entrepreneur. I see on your website that there are seven simple steps to improve communication. And that's kind of the hook to have people put their email in. Mm-hmm. Is that something you'd be open to sharing with our listeners and just verbally we can work through a few of those today? We can. Yeah. I mean, I honestly don't remember the seven specific communication tips that are in there. Um, it might be more helpful to talk about the 15 minute marriage makeover framework. Yeah, that, let's do that, it. That effectively what you're getting when you opt in and for anyone who wants to opt in and check it out, you're getting is a portion of one of the chapters of the book that's about communication, but the book overall has four pillars. So there's communication is the first and foremost, and then there's romance, there's sex and intimacy, and then money. Because those are, you know, the four big things that most people have issues with in the relationship. And I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, I I very rarely get asked about it in this context, but in the coaching that I do, the business coaching, you know, there's that whole sense of sell people what they want and give them what they need. So it's very often in the context of a coaching conversation, we'll be talking about like strategic marketing for a business. And they have some, some, you know, we talk about goals and we talk about what are you trying to accomplish? 
I often bring people back. Hey, you're married, right? Yeah. Okay. So how does this line up? Have you talked to your spouse about this? You know, like you're in a mastermind with all these other guys, but like, have you talked to your wife about the, the so you have a, that shared energy? So anyhow, I, I appreciate the context. Um, but yeah, those are the four pillars and kind of the way that book came about and the whole premise of the 15 minutes is it's 15 minutes a day of this quality time with your spouse. And th that's like a key thing for us. It became a key thing for us. Like we had the chaos of three kids, you know, and they're now a little bit older, two are teenagers, but at the time they were all small. And so, and my wife was working at the time as a special education teacher. I was doing the engineering career and a bunch of side hustles. And so we had a lot of stress and we, we had some issues. We were deeply in debt at, at one point. And what brought us out of that was this like conscious effort, something we learned at a marriage retreat, like just take 15 minutes to just be a couple each day, right? It, have your time. It could be in the morning over coffee before the kids are up. For us, it was typically in the evening after the kids were in bed. And I might very well, most nights after that time, go run off and write a blog post and she may go read a book or we may go out with one of our friends, you know, but we always took that 15 minutes first. So then the question becomes, well, especially the first few times you do this is like, okay, now we're sitting here awkwardly next to each other on the couch. Like, what do we do with this 15 minutes? And that's the whole book. It's a 28 day jumpstart plan. So basically the first week, there's seven exercises for communication. So each one is, is a day for 15 minutes. And then, you know, again, romance is the second week. Sex and intimacy is the third week. And money is the last week because money is the hardest of all those. Um, and so they, they kind of build on each other. Like it's really hard to have good money and financial conversations with your spouse if you haven't worked out the communication piece in the beginning. So you have sex is, and intimacy every week though? Or do you have to wait? <laughs> well, there, yeah, the, the, it has its focus in the third week. But uh, I know it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but um, <laughs> You have to read the book to get our to get our views on that, but absolutely, we're uh, we're definitely fans of doing that frequently. <laughs> I have got to say, Dustin, I absolutely love that you cannot recite the seven simple steps, and that's not facetious. I love that you can't do that because you're kind of going. I put a lot of work into that. Those seven steps are really an important seven steps. I now have that as passive income. Hey, I just told you. I put an hour a week into this thing. Right. I, I don't remember all that stuff while well, I do practice it. And, but you know, I'm making money off of that as passive income, which is a whole nother topic I might like to get into in a moment. Sure. Before we go there and kind of close up some of the conversation on the engaged marriage, can you give our listeners maybe one tip on each of those four? So we like to kind of pay our listeners back by giving them something actionable when we can with our guests so they yeah. can listen and then they can go do something later today. What could they do in the way of like, what's one thing on communication they could do? And then I'll ask you the question on the other three, if you're open to it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do my best. I'll, I'll wear that hat again. Just uh, one, just one thing like you're, you're consulting us or you're, uh, um, yeah, you're uh, coaching us. Yeah. And uh, our question is, hey, kind of generally, what are you seeing out there that people can and should be doing around communication? Yeah. So communication is the, the easiest one. We could spend the whole episode talking about communication with, with not only your spouse, but business partners and, and customers and everything else. I, it's again, it's one thing I'm passionate about. I think a quick tip for any any relationship, really, but just think about with your spouse is to practice reflective listening. And so guys are really bad about this. We're really bad about this. So the scenario is you just as you give an example to work through it, your wife comes home from a long day at work and she comes in and she's clearly frustrated. She kind of slams her purse on the counter and is like, you won't believe what my boss said to me today. Right. Our natural instinct as people who, you know, and this, again, this isn't, this is kind of a masculine trait, but it's not meant to be exclusive to one gender or the other, but because this definitely works both ways, but I, especially as an engineer, like type A personality, like I want to solve the problem, right? Like, okay, you need to go tell your boss this in response, right? That's not what my wife needs. My wife needs to be heard and listened to, and it's really hard for me. So that's an instinct I have to fight. And so reflective listening is simply, and this is great for podcast interviewing. This is great for getting customer feedback. It's, the, it's like consciously listening. And not trying to formulate a response in your head while you're listening because you'll miss something in the in what they're saying, right? You'll miss an emotion, you'll miss a nuance, you'll miss something. So reflective listening is letting her speak, in this case, in this example, kind of taking a deep breath with it and speaking back to her what I heard. 
oh, honey, I heard that you are really frustrated with your boss. I'm sure that's got you really, you know, ticked off. I can, I can see why you're frustrated. And then just shut up. Like, <laughs> that's it. Then if she wants your help, she may say, yeah, what do you think I should do about it? Or she may say, what do you want for dinner? Like, she just got off her chest. That's, that's it. But that's, and again, this is a spouse example. But if you're having a sales conversation with someone, reflective listening is super powerful. Like, someone really feels understood and they're like, you you really you actually really listen to what I said and you didn't interrupt me and you didn't try to give me an immediate solution and sell me something like you just told me back what I'm experiencing and feeling. That's excellent. So there are really the two steps to it that I heard. One is make sure you're being really present. So don't be rehearsing your uh, response or how you're going to problem. So just be super present and engaged. And then second, the first thing you do is validate what you heard. And I would assume if there's emotion involved in it, you're validating the emotion first versus the actual uh, content itself. So super stuff. Tell me about romance. Yeah. And these, I'll just be real quick. Um, you know, romance, I think the simple thing here is to have a designated date night on your calendar. And if it's not night, it could be lunch, it could be breakfast, whatever, at least once a month. But really, if you can do something once a week, even if it's at home, you know, after the kids are in bed, it doesn't have to be going out and spending money and being extravagant, but have a dedicated time on your calendar for, for weekly, ideally date nights, or at least date times, if you want to call it that. Um, and then sex and intimacy, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's plenty of uh, things to talk about with the role of masculinity and femininity and how you two relate and, and it can kind of get deep, but the real quick tip, I would say there's a really short book from a really good friend of mine, uh, friends, Tony and Elisa Del Lorenzo, and it's a book called The Seven Days of Sex Challenge. And it's just like what it sounds like. It's literally like prescribing to a couple to find a time soon on their calendar where they can, you know, be intimate seven days in a row and commit to that to each other without excuses, without all the stuff that's going to come up on your calendar to try to prevent it. And just commit to that to each other. And it walks you through, of course, how to approach this conversation and how it's not just physical. There's lots of forms of intimacy, but that's, I'll kind of defer to them. And, you know, that's actually one of the, one of the days in my 28 days is all about basically reading and, and planning, getting that book on your calendar to do together. Hmm. And then the final one, the money and finance, I think a really easy thing to do, not easy, but a really simple thing to do for a couple if you've got the communication rolling and you're feeling good about what you're doing with uh, with kind of your holistic life is to just have this conversation about your, your dreams, right? Like your ideal dream life, maybe 10 years out, because you may have never had the conversation. You probably have had it at some point, but you've very likely changed, right? Like you may have talked about when you're engaged and now I'm 20 years into marriage. So we try it on an annual basis. You know, we kind of do it between Christmas and New Year's, but we just kind of have that time set aside to say, Hey, um, let's talk about 10 years from now. So like I'll be 53 and our kid, you know, we'll have no kids in school and in high school anymore. Where do we want to live? What kind of lifestyle do we want to have? What kind of income? Where do we want to be working? And we've, you know, again, the whole podcast could be about this one conversation, but there was a moment in time just prior to starting engaged marriage that we were at a retreat and they had us go separately and write this vision. This was like a five-year vision, right? Just was a day in the life for me, like what, what's my ideal day in a life? And then she did the same. We didn't even know we were going to talk to each other. Well, then they had to sit knee to knee. And of course I had to read mine to her and she had to read hers to my, to me. It was a very emotional experience because in that conversation, that one conversation, she expressed that in an ideal world, she would actually like to be a stay at home mom. But we were, you know, we just had our third or second child at that point, And third was a little bit later. And but she quickly dismissed it and said, you know, we can't afford it. We're in debt, you know, but that, that's what because we had talked about this when we were dating. Well, on my sheet, I had no idea what she had written. I said, in an ideal world, I'd like you to be a stay at home mom, but I don't want to take away from you your master's degree and, and this fulfillment you get from doing special education. But we both it was like, this boom, light bulb moment, mind blown. We really want the same thing. And we haven't talked about it for years. And so that, that enabled us to devise a plan. We had common goals. We got out of debt. We did all this stuff. You know, that's where all these side hustles came in. Engaged marriage started really out of that mustard seed. So yeah, pretty powerful conversations can happen, but you got to consciously have them, right? Like if you don't put it on your calendar, it'll never happen. And I know we're talking about marriage and that's very important. These same things apply. I have these conversations with Ryan about Fire Creek. We need to have a shared vision. What do we want out of this? Do we want to sell the business? You know, like 
so we have common goals and those conversations don't often happen naturally. You have to like be conscious about it and, and, and say it out loud. Wow. That's so, exactly some of where my head was going and I wasn't rehearsing what I was going to say, Dustin, I was, <laughs> I was being present, but that's exactly where my head was going as I was going to ask you, what are the elements that you've learned and you practice and you coach on and engaged marriage that transfer over to business? Because I can immediately see, I mean, take out sex and intimacy, the rest of it uh, seems to fit. Like you yeah. would do coaching with a partnership on communication. Yeah. Hey, just be present and validate that you're listening to each other. Go have one time a week where you get away from doing the work of the business and you could just have your relationship yeah. and connect with each other and then talk about what your dreams are. Like it seems yeah. to be a formula that is just pervasive about relationships, period. So uh, yeah. I could see that right off the bat, but I'd love for you to expand on uh, some of that on how your work with engaged marriage translates to now being a business coach. Yeah, it, it's I, you nailed it, honestly. I mean, you kind of walked right through a lot of it. And people, you know, I have a very unique background. So if people want you, know, you introduce yourself and what do you do? And it's like, well, you know, technically I'm an engineer who sells meat sticks and helps married couples and business and coaches people on their businesses, right? It's, it's, it all sounds very different. But for me and the way my mind approaches these things, it's all the same. It's all problem solving. It's all a systematic approach to troubleshooting and being proactive. You know, that's kind of the, the, the system side of it. But I tend to be very um, intuitive as far as like uh, picking up on emotions and, and like, you know, so, so that helps, that helps in marriage coaching, but it very much translates into business coaching because at the end of the day, it's all relationships. That, that, that That's the big picture here. Everything is a relationship and it may be a client, you know, coach relationship. It might be a Fire Creek business owner, someone consuming a snack stick, you know, relation, customer relationship. It could be a spouse relationship. It could be a business partnership relationship. And one of the things I'm really passionate about in marketing is something I've, I've started calling partnership marketing. And I didn't really click with with it until you just said that, but it it kind of goes back to with my foundations with engaged marriage, right? Um, and we can talk about what partnership marketing means, but it's all relationship. It's all serving first. It's all trying to put someone else's interest first and realizing that that's how you ultimately win. Love it. <clears throat> and, you know, again, I just want to practice my reflective listening. I think that was awesome. By the way, I did that very early in our marriage. Uh, where I was always trying to solve the problem. Yeah. And it, it came down to exactly what you just said. I just wanted you to listen and let me get it out of off my chest so I could move on with my night. And I was trying to problem solve everything. And yep. so I, I relate to that and and I love communication. And I do I do believe, you know, your next step, which is do a daily a weekly date night, to me has been gold. Uh, we do a Saturday night date night forever. Awesome. Before marriage, after marriage, it's been many years now, 20 some years, every Saturday night, we're doing date night. We had a standing babysitter Saturday night that led to more communication, more sex and intimacy, more romance, more conversations about money and dreams and everything else. So to me, that was a key, uh, you know, the seven day book. I love that. I uh, would love to, to look that up. That, that That's a great piece of advice and talking about your dreams openly. And, and I love I, we have, or I try and enforce some conversations around the same period you do. I'm more wanting to talk about that than she is, but yeah, you know, between same, Christmas and New same. Year's, I, I'm always setting my goals for the next year and what are we going to do this year and where are we going and bucket list and all that kind of stuff. So thank you for sharing that. Let's move to the, the success coach side of it because, you know, I think you both made a great point, which is there's so much here that relates to actual real business too, with your partners in business and partners in marketing or what you're actually doing across the board. You know, you've mentioned, uh, partnership marketing a few times. You've mentioned lead with win earlier that I caught. And I was like, I want to learn more about what you do there. You just talked about shared vision a little bit. Take me to your simple success coaching, right? Yep. The word simple is in there for a reason. It's not just, yep. it's not just, um, engaged success coaching. Right, uh, right, right. It's simple, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, tell me a little bit more about why simple's in there. And talk to me a little bit more about lead with a win, partnership marketing, all the different components you may bring to a business if they were to contact you and say, hey, Dustin, work with me in my business. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the what people typically describe me as in, in that context is a clarity coach, right? So my gift is listening, 
reflectively. But yeah, listening to an entrepreneur in this case, you know, typically an online business owner who is stuck. Now they may be stuck kind of in the early stage. More often than not, they're kind of in the messy middle stage, right? Like they've got this, you know, maybe they're making a decent income, but not quite, you know, where they want to be and they're plateaued, right? And and a lot of this comes back to marketing. So I uh, I typically, a typical thing would be I I help people with a strategic marketing plan and help them implement it. So it's a little different. It's certainly not like a life coach, despite my marriage background. It's very strategic. And I think, as you pointed out, simple, right? Like I want us to be able to agree at the end of a session, like what you're going to do and have it be a really simple thing for you to do. That doesn't mean it's easy. Sometimes it's very difficult to do something simply. Um, but it's still, you know, something that you can actually wrap your mind around. Um, so, yeah, so the way that I work with simple success coaching is reflective of everything we've talked about. So almost every engagement is either an inbound referral or someone who heard me either talking about coaching or talking about Fire Creek snacks often, and you believe it or not. Um, and because I'm out talking about it, people want, want to know more. They want to know how we did it. They want to know, you know, how we got to seven figures, what are our tactics, those sort of things. And so they'll reach out. And then I invite them typical to, typically to a consultation call where I like literally re- will refuse to sell them anything. Like it's literally me listening to them and then talking to them what I've heard, kind of like a doctor, right? Like I, I'm absorbing what their problems are, what their symptoms are often. It's not necessarily the underlying cause. And then I'm usually coming back with a prescription to say, hey, I, and I'm a huge fan of 90 day timeframes. So a typical conversation, we'll talk for half an hour. At the end of that, I'll say, hey, I this is what I heard. I think this is what you're dealing with. I think this is where you're stuck. I would do this over the next 90 days. Let's just, you know, let's agree on a 90 day plan for you, an action plan. And I will just give that to them for free. This whole experience, this whole exchange has been free. Um, I'm leading with the win. I want to give them value. I want to show them I know what I'm doing and then I can, I can help them. And then I'll have, the inevitable question is, can you help me with this? So I, I like the plan. I think this is a great plan. I feel like I'm going to like, not, I'm not going to go do it. I'm not going to be accountable to myself. I'm going to hit some technical hurdle. And that's where the coaching comes in, right? It's like, sure, let's work together for 90 days. And then at the end of 90 days, if it makes sense, we'll have another conversation. We'll see if there's another 90 day plan. And if you need help, I'll help you with that. So that's a typical one-on-one coaching arrangement. And it kind of embodies, you know, what we've talked about, leading with the win, communication, um, hearing people out and be able to see under the surface, the huge benefit I have as a coach that many, a lot of coaches, as you guys are, I'm sure are aware, they're, they're coaches who sell coaching, right? That's like, they just do coaching. I'm different because of all the varied experience. You know, I've done engineering consulting. I've sold, you know, six figure contracts in that context. I've done um, the courses and membership side of the, of the world and email list. I've done e-commerce, you know, fairly successfully. Um, I've done marketing consulting. I've now done quite a bit of coaching. And so it makes me well-rounded. And between myself and all my different clients over the years, I've kind of touched every industry imaginable, you know, from dentists to barbecue grills, to meat sticks, to whatever. And so it gives me some perspective. And I typically have a lot of examples that I can point to people to be like, I, I worked with this client named Laverne. He had the exact same situation. How does it sound if you did these steps? Do you think that would help you? And so that's that's kind of my special sauce is just, you know, doing this stuff for a long time in a lot of different contexts. Um, so that's in a nutshell where Simple Success Coaching came from. That's why it's okay. called Simple. That's why if you go to the homepage, it says like, "Are you feeling stuck?" Like that's typically people come to me because they feel stuck. That's the word. That Sounds very stuck. simple to me. Yeah. Uh, I, I love it. And let me just clarify something. You did say typically an online business owner. Are you now at the point where it's exclusively online businesses? Because that's your specialty in online and e-com? Because you mentioned dentists and a few other people you've consulted with in the past. Uh, so right now, you know, if businesses are listening to this, what category do you fit in? Is it yeah. is it exclusively online products and services? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. I, I would take a call if someone, you know, had a local business issue. Again, a lot of times, if it's a, a strategic kind of marketing thing where they're stuck, they're plateaued, they're not sure what to do. I'm happy yep. to speak to people about that. But, you know, my any of my group programs are exclusively online. Um, okay. And right now, all of my one-on-one clients are online. That this just tends to be, you know, yeah. the, the way of the world, I guess. Well, and, it's where you, you also know, have and, proven and expertise work- with fire snack, fire uh, Creek snacks, right? Like it's like, look, here's yeah. proof in the pudding. Um, you yeah. mentioned, you know, a couple of times when you've plateaued and you also mentioned the messy middle. Can you tell me a little bit more about um, what you see the messy middle being? So in other words, if I'm an entrepreneur, I'm in an online business and you're kind of experiencing this specifically as symptoms, you should be calling me. 
Yeah. Well, a lot of times, and it's, it's a, it can vary like what makes people feel stuck. Typically, it's a revenue plateau, right? And a business standpoint. It could, so it could be someone who's got like a really good side hustle. They're me in circa 2017, right? Like things are going well. They want to make the leap. They don't quite have the confidence to, to make that leap out of corporate. And so I've coached quite a few people out of corporate into their own online business. It's not starting from scratch, but typically they have a, something going on on the side and they just need to scale it. So it's often an issue of scale. Um, I'm working with someone right now who's, I'm not going to say any, her name, but she's basically a TV celebrity, right? And she's got these programs and she does high-end group coaching and she's got, she runs the gamut though. And she's got so much stuff that it's all become convoluted in her mind. It's like out of control. She's built all these half-baked systems and she's got, so she's got a very lucrative business and she gets big dollars for being, you know, doing TV appearances and things like that. But she was referred to me and we almost had like a therapy call, right? Like we talked for 40 minutes, probably. She was just spouting out like Kajabi active campaign, like throwing out all this, all these softwares and jargons. And she's like, I just dusted. I don't even know where to start. And so like for her, our first month is basically me doing an audit. It's like, you go do what you like to do. Give me access to your stuff. And so this is more of a consultative thing. I don't do as much of this, but it's just a really cool opportunity with a really good person. And so I'm for her, I'm just like helping her get out of her own way, saying you shouldn't be touching this stuff anyway. Let's simplify this whole system. Let's say you have three products and you only have one, you know, funnel that that's running here. And how would that feel? You know, oh my gosh, that would be amazing. You know, but she, she can't see it for herself. She agrees with it once I say it out loud, right? So that's that's a typical kind of uh, place where people get stuck. They're just overwhelmed. And then sometimes it's, it's really just scale. Like one of the things I really help people with, and, and I know I've thrown this buzzword out a few times, the partnership marketing thing is, do you have a repeatable, in often case relationship-based means of marketing that like is happening all the time without you directly being involved? And a lot of entrepreneurs, especially solopreneurs, the answer is no, right? They may, have, they may do some Facebook ads. They may do some stuff that they've heard they should do but they don't have like a repeatable system that doesn't depend on entirely on their shoulders. And so you will naturally get stuck. Like you naturally will get to a, an income plateau and it depends on what you're doing. If you're coaching versus e-commerce, et cetera. Most of the people I work with are in those two buckets, right? They're coaches, consultants, or they're e-commerce. And that's because those are the two things I do is probably, so those are the people I attract. Um, and so if you want me to kind of get into the partnership marketing, because this is like the, that's like the, primary way that I help people with simple success coaching. Absolutely, please. So and the genesis of this is, as I talked about, I was getting all the, I didn't have, simple success coaching did not have a website until like three months ago. I've been doing coaching for several years and it was all inbound, right? So it's, it, so never, and it still is, I've never actually marketed anything for simple success coaching. I'm always just out telling my own story or talking about Fire Creek or whatever. So I was doing that. And as I started learning new ways to talk about fire Creek and really get into the origin story and talk about my own story with it. And Ryan's origin story, he's a third generation butcher shop owner. There's a lot of cool history and story in that brand. So I started getting featured inadvertently on podcast, uh, you know, talking about fire Creek. And so it might be about the, how does the business partnership work? It might be about, I was on like the official Shopify podcast, Shopify masters. It's talking about like conversion rates and apps and, you know, like very technical stuff. But in the course of that, what I found was no matter what show I was on, podcast specifically, no matter what genre or niche or whether you know there were meat stick eaters you know raising their hand in the audience or not, and in most cases not, I always got great results. And it was direct sales. I give a coupon code or whatever, and I would know that people are buying meat sticks, and that was good. That was a good enough reason to show up. What I didn't realize on the back end was how powerful all the relationships were that came out of this this effort. And so, you know, I, I've got a million examples, but like I hired a marketing intern who reached out because I was on a podcast. I got a one hour Zoom call with the head meat snacks buyer at Walmart because um, someone in finance at Walmart heard me on a podcast and connected us. Um, I've had great business opportunities. We've landed distributorships. I don't know if you guys have heard of a, a company called Snack Nation. They rebranded to Carew, <clears throat> but it's like this big company and they sell subscriptions to better for you snacks for employees. And so I was on a, I was on their podcast that their that their company owns, and it's a whole backstory on how I got on there. But effectively, I got on there, did a small run with them because we were a very small brand, especially at that time. This was two years ago, and that was I thought that was the end of it, right? In January, like three months ago, 
two months ago, uh, I got this email from some woman I'd never heard of. And she says, Hey, my name's Sharon. I, you know, you worked with George here previously. And, and I, I was connected with George. I knew he moved on from LinkedIn. And she says, I've been going back through his files. You guys' stick you did. And this is like 2020, like mid 2020 was really popular, like very good reviews on the small run. And I listened to your podcast and I'm, I'm in love with the brand, you know, and what's your capacity. And so we've literally had a, we've had purchase orders this year. This just happened like a month a month ago is when the purchase order was executed for 500,000 snack sticks. Uh, and that was from a podcast I did two years ago that had no outcome in mind when I got on there. So the long story short is I was doing all this stuff for Fire Creek and I've been on 20, 20, 25 podcasts just for Fire Creek. And I was like, this is a really, on the surface, it seems random, but when you repeat it enough and I got into this cadence for every week, I was making sure I was pitching to be on a, a podcast or a subscription box, or there's lots of forms of partnerships. But the idea is win, win, win in this case, right? Like, so, and this, what we're doing today is an example, a perfect example for anyone listening. Hopefully I'm leading with the win for your audience. Hopefully they enjoy the story. They get some marriage tidbits. You know, there's, there's a win for them. Hopefully you guys feel it's a win when we're done. And you say, that was a good interview. You know, like that was quality that like, adds content to, to what we do. And it, it's good for our traffic. And of course it's a win for me. Cause I get to talk about my story. Maybe there's someone who needs some coaching. Maybe someone wants to buy some meat sticks, whatever, but it's the whole partnership marketing is getting yourself in front of your ideal audience on someone else's platform and in a win, win, win way. What we're doing here is very kind of loose, but you know, some of the people I work with, it's very targeted. If I'm a, if I'm working with a client, for example, to give this a better, a better direct example, if they're a, they're a health coach who helps women with chronic pain, I've actually had that person as a client before. Um, it's very easy for them to do targeted research and find shows with a lot of those people in the audience, right? You know, so maybe fe- mid, mid, middle-aged females who are dealing with chronic pain. There might be a lot of them in certain podcast audiences. And so if she's systematically pitching to be on those shows and has a really compelling story, has some really good help, helpful information for the, for that audience, she can build a really strong coaching business simply off of these partnerships. And that's really the genesis of partnership marketing is taking that. But rather than just thinking of it as like a one-off, yeah, maybe next month I'll be on someone's show or I'll wait till someone invites me to be on a podcast. It's looking for proactively looking for these partnerships um, in a systematic way to where you're doing on a regular cadence. And, and so the four steps really quick, I know I'm, I'm going on and on about this, but like step one is purpose. That's simply answering the question, what do you want to get out of a partnership for you? Right. So it's on a podcast. It's typically going to be like your call to action at the end. Like, why would you want to be on the show? It's so that I can, you know, if I'm a health coach, just so I can invite people into a, a free video I have on chronic health issues. That's, that would be my call to action. That's the purpose of being on the show. Step two is plan. And that's the research side of this. It's not just blindly going out and being on, trying to be on shows, but shows that really make sense for you and your brand and what you're trying to accomplish that, you know, you'll resonate with their audience and doing that in a kind of high volume systematic way. And then prioritizing those opportunities. So you always know the next one you're going to, you know, be, be step three, which is pitch and pitch in a very helpful, warm way. The thing that got me so sold on this whole idea is for Fire Creek, I was reaching out to some pretty decent sized podcasts. And the first 12 podcasts I pitched, I got yeses on from a single cold pitch email. So there's kind of an art and science to it. I've got a, you know, a, a, a template I follow, but every email is very personal and it's, it's connecting on a personal level with that host. And again, this, when we're talking about podcasts, but think about anyone who has an audience that they're the host, right? It could be a conference. It could be a joint venture webinar. It could be a subscription box if you have a physical product. But think about that host. How can you connect with them and lead with the win for them if effectively show the value that you're going to provide in advance? So that's step three is that, that pitch. It's really critical. And the step four is perform. So right, that's how do you prepare for a show? How do you do really well when you're on the show? How do you connect deeply and emotionally with the audience? How do you follow up with the host so that you become a great referral for them to others in the industry, et cetera? And then there's a bunch of advanced stuff we do. So I teach these group workshops, walking people through this partnership marketing system. And then the ultimate goal after they've learned it and they've embraced it and they, they, they feel really jazzed about it is to then send a virtual assistant through the same training and let them do all of step two and three on a repetitive basis. So the research and the draft pitch emails are, are that they, they own that 
And then the entrepreneur or the business owner really just has to show up for interviews, right? And then in the podcast example, but show up in, in these partnerships. And it's changed my life. And that's not an exaggeration. I've been really focused on this for about a year and a half. It's blown up Fire Creek. Um, it's just been the only thing I've done to do to do my coaching business. And I have plenty of business there. Uh, so yeah, I'm a huge, huge fan of, of partnership marketing. That is an awful lot to validate and an awful lot of value in there. Let me do my best. <laughs> I heard, so partnership marketing is this repeatable relationship-based marketing where you are getting uh, on someone else's platform, whether it be a podcast or kind of tapping into another set of clients, ears or eyeballs. Yep. Um, I wrote down that you do that systematically to pitch in your niche. So you're kind of looking for your niche and where those platforms exist that other people have built the platform and how to be part of that. We've had a number of guests on who have talked about a couple of concepts that um, two in particular uh, have talked about. One was all about telling your own story yep. and the importance of that. And you tapped right into that. Another one was talking about this flywheel marketing effect. Yeah. At every push, you might not actually feel the difference, but the cumulative difference, it goes faster and faster and faster. Yeah. And that bonus um, stuff that I mentioned, like literally the first module is called the marketing flywheel. And it's how to make this a system that doesn't depend on you putting forth effort. It becomes a self-sustaining system, especially if you can hire someone like a virtual assistant to do a lot of the legwork for you. Yep. Excellent. I, I can immediately tell that you do have a lot of experience in a lot of places because we've had specialists on talking about some of the very concepts that you use as, uh, to your own admission, kind of a generalist. You have your hands in a lot of things, but you're talking about very high-end stuff that we've had specialists on to talk about. I'd love to just take a quick moment and get a piece of advice from you that hopefully our listeners will get value from. The Entrepreneurs that I work with are primarily uh, painting business owners. They're residential painting and commercial painting. If I wanted to work with them on applying partnership marketing, and I'm not looking for you to break down a whole thing, sure. but like what would be a couple things that I would recommend in terms of finding a niche when it comes to painting residential and commercial properties? and how to systematically do this repeatable relationship-based marketing, where would you suggest they start? Yeah, it's a great question. I, that's that's one, uh, one individual I've not worked with as a painter. But so I, I always start with the question, start with the mindset, where can they provide a win to someone who would be a referral source for that type of work, right? Mm. So it could very well be that they want to get on the really good side of the local uh, realtors association, right? Because I would think realtors are great referral sources for painters as they're wanting to put a house on the market. Now you really need to repaint this living room. If I've led with the wind for those realtors, you know, it could be educating. So it could be like doing a lunch and learn for a, say a, a local realtors group and talking about the latest trends in paint color or paint quality or, you know, um, or it could literally be like, finding the lead of that group and offering to paint the inside of her house as a, as a, as a, uh, a leading, as a leading of value, inferring that, you know, it'd be great to get some referrals as from your, from your group. And that could be with brokers, you know, it could be with the realtors themselves. I just, realtors is kind of where my mind went immediately. I can I also, also be picture that even being like with landscapers. With, uh, with other trades, right? So like the other people who get inside other people's houses and do services, that you you have a shared referral source, right? So every every lead your painters have is a value to a finished carpenter, a carpet cleaner, or whatever. And if they have a way in their local community to systematize the sharing of those leads and referrals, I mean, I'd be looking to put a system in, in place to do that. I think uh, would be a really a really smart way to approach it. And yeah, that's catching me cold and off the top of my head. Yeah, I, that's the mindset though. Is like I don't need to spend money necessarily, but where can I lead and provide value to someone who will be compelled to, you know, in this case, be a, 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 re, a service based referral. Doing that cold. I think that's excellent. What you just provided there. It's 
where can they provide a win to someone who has relationships with their customers already? And Realtors is a great example. I could see landscaping being yep. another one because, uh, you know, carpentry is a skilled trade. It's not like I'm going to do DIY carpentry in my house. It's like everybody has to hire that out unless you are skilled yourself. But something like uh, landscaping, many people do DIY. The people who can afford a landscaper can probably also afford a professional painter. Yeah. So, yeah, that's an excellent place to start. I appreciate that. I want to ask one more question. Um, and dialing back, you had said that you do coaching and strategy work. We haven't talked about the strategy work side. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, and you know, I, I, I guess I touched on it without naming it, but many times, not always, but many times that's going to be a marketing strategy. So it could be, hey, you know, I've got this... Um, this coaching service that I want to provide. And I've been doing some Facebook ads. I've been dabbling in, you know, blogging or whatever. And I've been trying these different things. It's like looking at it cohesively and saying, let's step back. Like, so the strategy part of it is what's the goal you want, right? Like what is your, so I always start with the clients. I always start with a three-year vision for, for their business and their family, you know, like for their personal life and their business life. Then we step back that back to one year goals, which are typically revenue based, but you know, they can be, they, there's certainly other aspects of that. And then that one year plan always gets broken out into a 90 day plan. 90 days, they can sink their teeth into, it's very tangible. There's only 12 weeks, it feels urgent, but there's still enough time to actually make a difference. So that's that's almost always the framework we're working within. And then what is within that framework is whatever they're stuck on. Most of the time they want more sales, you know, that's most, most of the time it's a marketing and sales question. So then it's implementing a system within that 90 day framework. It used to be more varied. And I, and I think I started, I started down this path earlier when I was talking about Fire Creek is I started being out doing partnership marketing for Fire Creek without calling it that, but just being out doing subscription box placements, doing podcast interviews. And I saw all this, like what I call the network effect, all these like crazy effects that were coming from that. All of my 90 day plans as I was working with one on one clients started to look like partnership marketing plans because like it may look different. Like we just talked about with the painter, it may look different for each business slightly, but I think almost every business, especially every online business can benefit from a partnership marketing system. So it's just customizing that with them, working through the 90 day plan. So as I started doing that a lot last year, I went to like 20 clients and we're just doing all the partnership marketing. It became very repetitive. So then I started doing group work. It's kind of like the next, you know, the next step. So now I do groups, small groups that lead through this, this system. It's actually way better. It's actually way more effective than doing it one-on-one um, for a variety of reasons. But that's the, so the strategy to me is baked into the whole thing. It's, it's really about thinking about something holistically and having a desired and named outcome. So it's not just like doing activity for activity's sake. It's building towards a, a defined result. Yeah, I love that. And Dustin, you know, you started off very early in the conversation saying, you know, I like to lead with a win. And even on this today's conversation, I mean, a really good example, right? Uh, here's a business engaged marriage that you're not really active in, uh, but you spent a good 20 or 30 minutes <laughs> helping us and our audience understand a little bit more about something that Rich made a good point of. We don't talk about enough. And that was a win. That was a win for us. That was a win for our audience. And then on top of that, you had an opportunity to talk about your expertise and what you actually do as an active business. That is, pro you know, if I'm listening to this and I had a need for that as an online business, going up, he's going to give me a, he's going to listen, present, do reflective listening, present me up with a plan for free. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're offering our audience to an opportunity to show that you can help lead with them with a win to see if they want more. So. Really, really appreciate that side of things. I think if you keep giving as an entrepreneur, you'll get paid back at some point. But if you have that expectation of I'm coming on just for me or I'm coming on just for the sale, you know, that's not that's not the right approach. So I really, really appreciate that. If you had one message to provide an entrepreneur who is considering an online business, considering a side hustle, considering leaving their corporate career to jump in and be an entrepreneur and just go for it. What would that one message be? Well, I, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I mean, for one to be leading with the wind. So what do they feel called to do? You know, business is hard and starting a new business is, is hard. It can be, you can do it in a simple way, but it's, there's no question. There's a lot of effort. There's a reason not everyone's cut out to be an entrepreneur. So 
don't do it because you think it's going to be some easy way to make money. I mean, you, I really feel like you need to have some passion behind what you're doing or you're going to regret and you're going to get burned out. Um, the other aspect is, again, to kind of touching on my own story is don't be afraid to experiment, you know, so do something you feel called to do something that sounds fun, a, a group that you like to serve, maybe something that kind of already fits into your experience and skill set. Usually it's a problem you've already solved for yourself. So that's kind of how you're coming up with the, the idea. But I think the piece of advice there is don't be afraid to test and experiment and view all, I kind of view all of life as an experiment, right? Like that whole no permanent decisions. There are a few permanent decisions. I mean, I hope your marriage is a permanent decision. If you decide to uh, you know, enter a religious order, it's typically a permanent decision. But outside of a very few small things, almost nothing's a permanent decision. And whatever you think you're going to be doing in five years will probably look much different. I know for me, it, looking back, the way these dots connect. There's no way I would ever predicted where I'm at sitting here talking to you guys today. I'm really glad I'm here, but I only got here because I wasn't afraid to experiment with different ideas and with different relationships and reaching out and kind of being bold in my purpose and what I'm trying to do and being really intentional about it, right? That's awesome, Dustin. Thanks a lot for leading with a win with us today. Uh, great conversation. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Please stick around for a few more minutes while Rich and I break down this episode. Rich, what I loved about Dustin's approach to leaving corporate America, starting on his own is something that really resonated with me and has been a guiding post for me in terms of what I want to do with my career, which is what's something you're passionate about, something you can be the best in the world at or one of the best in the world at, and it can drive your economic engine. Dustin found that, and it's interesting, he found it, you know, a little bit by by path, right? Like he started off with engaged marriage, side business, started learning more about digital marketing, figure out oh, that maybe digital marketing is the component and then figured out, oh, I specialize in online, online sales. I could do really good here with, with Fire Creek Snacks. He's done a great job. And he said something earlier when I asked him the final question, like what would you encourage entrepreneurs to do if they were considering starting their own business, becoming an entrepreneur, leaving, leaving corporate America? And when, when he answered, that's the first thing that came to mind. Find something you're passionate about that you can be really, really good at, study it, try and be the best at it, where you can make money. Find those three points, and that's a really you know, successful uh, opportunity for you. You know, and to that point, he also said, don't be afraid to test an experiment. And he did that personally. He went out and yeah. tested and experimented himself, and there's a little bit of risk involved. But one of the things I took a note on that was just talk about simple, and it was also refreshing, was he said, everything is the same. It's relationship building and problem solving. Mm -hmm. So when our listeners who are entrepreneurs are thinking about doing something entrepreneurial, and they're ready to take a little bit of a risk and put their toe in it, like, have a little confidence. Everything's the same. If you're good at relationship building, and you're good at problem solving, Another business is just another business. Principles uh, translate very easily. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and when you when you to your point, you take the princ- the personal principles, whether it be friendships, whether it be marriages, whether it be on the professional side, business partnerships, partnerships or relationships within your organization. All of them can use the same principles that were talked about here in terms of communication, which is usually a gap with colleagues, right? They just don't communicate properly or they don't communicate enough. They don't have the, you know, they don't have that routine going all the way down to the personal relationships you have in your life, your business partnerships, you know, all those, it's all the same. And again, I, uh, being a dead horse, as I think we did in the conversation with Dustin, if you're leading with a win for the other person with no expectations of anything in return, that's being kind. That's being a good person. Mm. I love that aspect of Dustin. And when you challenged him on going down the marriage angle of tell us more about this, uh, it wasn't necessarily why he was coming on to talk to us today, but he was very openly willing to talk the whole conversation about it if that's what we wanted. Uh, I just love uh, that aspect of what Dustin brings to businesses and people. Yeah. Uh, I I will tell you when I was talking to him about the, uh, translation of what he did with a does with engaged marriage and bringing that over to business i was really close to saying so take john and me as an example and then i looked down i'm like the sex and intimacy part i'm like eh, i'm not gonna use it like let's just take a hypothetical person so uh i want you to know i protected both of us in Thank that you. moment by not using us as an example 
I appreciate that very much. <laughs> <laughs> so I, part, partnership marketing. Oh my gosh. Like I know he, he dropped it a few times and then he expanded on it. And I got an awful lot out of that. And obviously I had asked about, you know, with a painting business, what would you do? And it came right back to the core of providing a win to somebody. And who can you provide a win to who has relationships with your customer base currently and in the painting business or not in the painting business? What a core question to be able to then connect with the people who already have relationships with your customers instead of starting from the ground up. Exactly. And what he said on partnership marketing that I captured and I loved was, do you have a repeatable means of marketing? Or to put it a different way, a repeatable mean with some partner where you get leads on a repetitive basis, right? A lot of people, what they do is I'm going to spend a hundred dollars on this Facebook ad and it's going to generate me 10 leads. And those 10 leads are going to generate X amount of revenue. But if you don't, gen if you don't put that Facebook ad up next month, you're not getting those leads and the revenue is not coming in. So it's a pay once, get the reward of the leads in that particular scenario. But to use the example you gave, which if, they're not doing it in your in your system. Maybe it's something they should consider is go get a partnership with the leading landscape company, the leading electrical company, the leading plumbing company, whatever, and have a system where when you're out painting a home, you're like, do you need any landscaping, electrical plumbing services? And go bring it to those companies as a lead with a win and go, hey, I have this opportunity for you. Why don't you do the same after every landscape job as ask the customer if they need any painting? Uh, what a way that if that's going on, you get six or seven companies that are, that are promoting your services of while you're promoting six or seven companies, everybody wins. What typically happens though, Rich, from my experience, and I don't know if you've experienced this, it's like, well, what if I get them five leads and they get me none? Are they going to pay me for every lead that I bring them? What do I get for this? And I get a lot of that and typically kills everything. Have you experienced that? Yeah, and it reminds me of the a typical networking group that um, I won't name the name of, but there's a networking group that's a national networking group that all different uh, not related trades get together to be able to swap customers and leads. And from what I have heard, it variably works. What absolutely works is everybody in your group becomes a customer of each other. So you, you know, you pick up eight or 10 clients from the people in your group. But in terms of really tapping into each other's customer base, I think because uh, the principle of leading with a win is probably not used uh, for the other person's customer base. So there's no real reason to market it because there's not a win that I could bring my customer base. It's just kind of handing you my list, which is, you know, my gold in my business. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would agree with that. I think entrepreneurs, business owners, entrepreneur, everybody, if you go into every relationship, relationship with your customer, relationship with your vendor, relationship with your colleagues, relationship with your boss, relationship with anybody with this mindset of, I'm just going to give. And if I find opportunities that are going to help you or help others, if you just give to a hundred people, on a continuous basis, you may not get a, get get a hundred people giving back to you, but if you get ten, because they know how kind and gracious you've been, I think that's a win. And and if you approach everything like that, just the way Dustin does, I think that we'll see a lot of benefit from that. And specifically, give to people where you're thinking partnership marketing, where there's repeatable relationship based marketing, where you can tap into someone else's platform of communication and systematically to pitch in your niche, telling your story and keeping that flywheel effect of marketing going. Just keep it going. <laughs>